Do you want to get the inside scoop on how Google views your website? Or maybe you want to be able to, to submit new blog posts and new pages to Google so that they start showing up in search results. If that's the case, then you're definitely going to want to sign up for Google Search Console. Don't worry, it's free and it's easy and I'm walking you through the entire process in this video. What's up guys? Welcome back to my channel. I'm Mariah from MariahMagazine.com where I help you figure out the DIY solutions for website tech and SEO. Today in this video, I'm showing you how to sign up for Google Search Console, how to verify your website on there, and how to connect Google Search Console with Google Analytics. All right, let's get started. Okay, so now I'm going to show you how to sign up for Google Search Console if you're not already signed up yet. So this is a free tool. So you're just going to Google, Google Search Console, or I can leave the link to this in the steps that I've outlined. So go ahead and click on that. And we're gonna click the Start Now button. And it's gonna have you sign in to your Google account. Now this is important. You wanna make sure that you're signing in to the same Google account that is connected to your Google Analytics. This is going to make the verification process a trillion times easier. Okay, so I am going to log into one of my accounts. And once we do that, it's going to have you kind of type in your URL. Um, you can go ahead and select an entire property type, but that's going to require DNS verification. So that basically means that you're going to have to log into wherever your domain is hosted and add a TXT file. Okay, so if that sounds like super overwhelming and you're like, nah, I'm definitely going to need another option here, we can always do the URL prefix, okay? It's important that you put in the URL that your website is, okay? So you're gonna be like, wait, what are you talking about? So there's different prefixes. So like you can see in this example, there's HTTPS, www dot <clears throat> your domain name. There's also HTTP, www, and then there's HTTPS without the www, okay? And then, HTTP with the www. So there's actually four different kinds of your domain name. I know it's it's super annoying, but yeah. So we're gonna want to type in like the actual um, domain name that your website is. So for this one, I think this website is non www. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna open this up, copy it, paste this right in here. Once you do that, you're going to go ahead and click continue. It's going to check your verification. Okay. So if you already have your Google Analytics set up with this Google email, it's going to verify it automatically. Okay. If you don't, you're going to need to do another verification method, which could be like clicking your domain provider let's say GoDaddy, for example. And then you're gonna have to sign into that, follow the steps, make sure that you own it. It's, it can be a headache. So just make sure that you're logging into the same Google Analytics thing. And it's also gonna be important for when we connect this Google Search Console account with your Google Analytics account, okay? So once you go ahead and do that, you're gonna go ahead and go to property, and then you're gonna see a screen like this. Best practice is to add all of those URL prefixes. Do you have to do that right now? No, but I do want to let you know that it is best to now go in and be like, okay, let's go ahead and add the www version. So it's going to verify it, go to property. Okay, so you're going to want to add all four versions. So the HTTP non www and then the HTTP www version. Okay, it's super easy once you get started though, but 
yeah, practices to definitely have all four of those all set up. I'm going to show you how to connect your Google Analytics account to that Google Search Console account that you set up. So what this is going to do is it's going to allow you to see some of your Google Search Console information within your Google Analytics data, which can be really helpful. So what you're going to want to do is log into your Google Analytics account. And then we're going to come over here and click behavior. Nope, just kidding. We're clicking acquisition and then we're going to click search console and then you're going to click landing pages and you're going to see that this report requires search console integration to be enabled okay so we're going to go ahead and click this setup search console button and then we're going to scroll down and click adjust search console so you'll see that there is no um, linking being done here so we're going to go ahead and click add that's going to open up the other like it's going to open up your search console account that's connected to your google email address that you're signed up with so we're going to go ahead and click the website property so when you're linking these website properties if you went ahead and added all four of those options the http https and then the www non www Holy crap, that's a mouthful. Um, you're gonna want to connect the version that is set to default on your website, okay? So like mine, for example, is HTTPS www. But on my other website that I run, Create It Collective, it's my default one is the non www. So whichever one is defaulted in this URL browser is the one that you're gonna wanna connect with this search console account okay so then we're going to go ahead and click save so it says you're about to save a new association so yes we absolutely want to save a new association yeah so then it automatically kicks you over to google search console which is kind of a pain in the butt so we actually have to go back to the tab where we had google analytics open refresh the page and then you'll see that it actually shows the website now so it's gonna, yeah, all of this is fine. And then just click save. So now we have your Google Search Console and your Google Analytics set up and integrated together. And that's it for today's tutorial. So if you'd like more help DIYing your SEO, I have an online course that runs you through all of the important things so that you can get your website on Google's good side. You can see all of the details over at Mariah Magazine slash Easy SEO, but I'll also post a link to that in the video description below. And if you prefer a more one-on-one -on -one SEO consulting, I totally offer Power Hour sessions to help you get more results from your website and to help you make more money. So if you found this video helpful, make sure that you give it a super quick thumbs up for me and then take a second to comment below and let me know how it went. And if you're not a subscriber yet, make sure that you hit that subscribe button because you don't want to miss out on all of the DIY website tech and SEO tutorials I have coming your way. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Search Off the Record, a podcast coming to you from the Google Search team, discussing all things search and having some fun along the way. My name is John, and I'm joined today by Lizzie and Gary from the Search Relations team, of which I'm also a part of. Say hi, Lizzie. Hi, Lizzie. Say hi, Gary. Nah, I don't want to. No. Anyway, Gary, it's, it's great to be back here, but why am I here? Well, we were told that you don't like us anymore, and I kind of wanted to twist your arm into coming back and, uh, you know, show your face. Uh, Wait, voice. that's the wrong format. <laughs> I was thinking that I don't even know when, maybe half a year ago or so, we had an episode or about robots.txt, and it was a fun episode. And uh, then I was thinking about what else is similar to robots.txt, and we ended up with sitemaps. And I happen to know that you were involved in sitemaps in some ways back in the days, like 1902 AD, 
and maybe you could talk about your experience with sitemaps and then we probably just deep dive into certain parts of sitemaps. Cool. Okay. So I I guess you could say sitemaps is how I snuck into Google, which may be a good thing. Who knows? We'll see what happens. I don't really know much about the story internally with regards to sitemaps way in the beginning, but I I kind of saw that externally. So I, I was active at uh, my own software company and kind of interested in the web and then somehow got interested into SEO. And then at, as it happens, Google happened to launch sitemaps right around that time. And I thought, well, this is a is a cool way to sneak into Google. So I started trying to, to look into that a little bit. And I I noticed that there were no sitemaps generators in, in the early days, or no kind of easily usable sitemaps generators. So I made one of the first sitemap generators for Windows at the time. I, I think sitemaps was launched in 2005. Maybe like in the in the very very beginning, it was a Google initiative, and then later it became supported by other search engines as well. Right around that time, Google also published Script to create sitemaps. How how your generator was different from from that script? Well, I I made a generator for for Windows, so instead of having to run some obscure script in this weird programming language that nobody knew about at the time called Python. So I made something that was more usable by, I don't know, like average site owners, or I, at least I thought it would be. So basically you enter your website and then it goes off and crawls your website based on some uh, settings that you provide. And uh, then in the end, when it knows about everything, it, it generates a sitemap file for you. I thought that was pretty neat at the time. And the, the sitemaps project was, I, I think, launched between different teams in Mountain View, uh, in Kirkland, and in Zurich. So th there was definitely a big team in Zurich at the time, which I didn't really realize. I was like, I don't know, as someone externally from Google, you just see, oh, Google, and you have no idea what is actually behind it. But uh, it, it was interesting because at some point I got invited to chat with the team in Zurich. It was interesting to meet some of the people that were active there. And I, I think one of the people that I met there still works in Zurich. So so that was pretty cool. I think the initial initiative from the sitemap side or from Google was, was really about kind of understanding the web a little bit better, making it easier to crawl and find all of the content on the web. Did you feel like that helped at the time, like when you started using a sitemap, like did that help with your early SEO uh, experiences trying to get your uh, software company sites found? To, to some extent, I, I thought, especially the process leading up to that was really helpful. I don't know, SEOs did it at the time, but it's kind of that process of crawling your website was really eye-opening because in, in the early days, you're like, well, Google is this big magic black box and nobody really knows what, what it's actually doing. And then when you crawl your website yourself, you realize, oh, there are actually a lot of technical details that are involved with crawling. And there are a lot of things that you can do right or that you can do wrong on your website. And that I, I thought was really interesting. Uh, so it kind of like regardless of whether or not sitemap files actually helped with the visibility of your website, that step of creating a sitemap file forced you to look at your website and think about, well, what are all of the URLs that Google could find? And why is it not finding this part? And what's up with all of these parameters and upper and lower case and all of these things where when you crawl your website, it's like suddenly this infinite mess. And uh, when you see that for the first time, you realize, well, actually, this is something that I can control. And uh, this is something that a site owner can kind of work on to, to make it easier for search engines to crawl. So then did you make some changes on your website based off of the learning exercises? And if so, what kind of changes did you do? I, I don't know the details of what, what I changed on the website, but uh, things like uh, URL parameters were, were super common and uh, kind of understanding that using random URL parameters like like session IDs and URL parameters at the time was, I don't know, it was super common to, to have, that you just have this really wrong, long number as a parameter attached and every user gets a different number. And that's something that in, in the early days, 
you would look at a website and say, well, it is how it is. And like, I'm not supposed to understand all of these things. But when you crawl it, you realize, well, actually, this makes it pretty much impossible to crawl the website properly unless the search engine can figure that out. And if you can figure it out for the search engine, it makes it a little bit easier. I noticed this on, on our website, but also when I made the generator, like other people were using it and they would contact me and like say, well, I ran your tool on my website and it's not stopping. And then you kind of are forced to look at other people's websites and try them out as well. And then you notice that, that these kind of crawling issues, they're just everywhere. I, I think a lot of that has gotten significantly better because people use more common CMS systems and they don't generate this kind of messy website anymore. But at least back in the early days, it was super common to have a website that was pretty much impossible to crawl. I think the session ID, that was one of those things that it was pretty much transparent to, to, to a human eye. Basically, it was so prevalent on the internet that you didn't even notice as a human in the URL. And you are just like assuming that it's not there. But for a search engine or for any crawler, basically that meant that there's an infinite number of URLs, well, pseudo infinite number of URLs on the site. And as with any crawler, crawlers are happy to crawl the URLs. And sitemaps probably were an, a very eye-opening thing uh, for for webmasters and site owners and developers in in general. Yeah. What about the different tags that can show up in a sitemap? Because I'm fairly certain that most people who who dealt with sitemap know that um, you have the LOC lock tag uh, where you put the URL, and then you have a bunch of other tags like priority and change frequency that are basically covered in myth. And some people think that search engines use them. Some other people think that search engines don't use them. How were those with your generator? Taking a step back, the sitemap files themselves are basically text files. And you can look at them in a text editor, which at the time, like that was kind of interesting for me to see. I expected to see some, I don't know, machine language file, but XML is essentially like HTML page and you have different tags and different content in there. And the main tags there for sitemap files are really like the URL. You specify the URL. I don't even know what they're all called nowadays or what they're still called. But there are also extra fields that you can add, which I think are optional, uh, like the last modification date, uh, the change frequency, and the priority. And I'm sure I'm forgetting something, but uh, something along those lines. And the interesting thing, I think, is the assumption I have from the sitemap side is that Google wanted to understand a little bit better which pages are changing how frequently and which pages you think are important. And uh, that's kind of with the change frequency and the priority uh, data in the sitemap file. But it feels like that was something that was more like wishful thinking, like maybe we can learn more about the web like this. Uh, because in practice, of course, if you give people a field that says priority, they're going to say like, my website is the most important and all of my pages are the most important. And using that as a way to understand more about the website is then really hard because people are just biased and they think their stuff is the most important. Well, but is the priority supposed to be like on the web or within the context of your own site? Because I guess that would be a good exercise to prioritize within your own site, which ones are the things that change more often. So why wouldn't you actually go through that exercise unless you're thinking like, oh, this is like me, my website compared to your John Mueller website. I think mine is priority number one. I think you are being way too rational. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not accounting for other things on the internet. I mean, the, the internet itself is not a rational place. And if um, you are a small business owner, for example, then why would you want to do that exercise, basically? You just want to say that, well, I published these pages and all these pages are important to me. So here. I guess, is the crawl budget a thing here? Most people don't even know about crawl budget. There's a few bigger entities on the internet who made crawl budget a thing. But before, I don't want to say a stupid date, but I will say 2013, I rarely ever heard of crawl budget. And then suddenly it came to be, and then we started talking about it because reasons. I think... The idea behind priority is is kind of understandable, but at the same time, if you're making these files for any larger website, you have to automatically fill out these values. 
things and you don't necessarily know like what what is the relative priority of this random blog post that I have? And at some point you just say, well, everything is important or you create this kind of artificial structure of priority for, for your website, but you can't really determine it yourself. And at that point, the data is, is not really that useful. And I think even in our documentation, we now say like, we don't use priority uh, from a sitemap file. This is true. Also goes for uh, change frequency, I think, where you can't actually expect to know when your page will actually change, like how often should it change? Because if you have the terms of service, for example, or if we go to our documentation to developers.google.com slash search, there are pages that we haven't touched for two years now because we just had no reason to touch them. But when we publish those pages, we wouldn't have known that we are not going to touch them for two years. Okay, so there's the change frequency thing, but then there's also the last mod thing. I mean, the last modification date is something that I would say there there is an absolute value that you can supply there. And that's something that the script can look at. And if it looks at your pages and says, well, like I updated this page one year ago or last week, it's a, it's a real date that you can supply. Whereas with the change frequency, you don't really know in advance how often it'll change. And it's more that search engines could over time track kind of how often this page changes on average, and they could use that to determine how often to recrawl it. So at that point, why would a site owner specify that directly? Because it's it's much more tempting to say, well, this page could change every day, even if it doesn't. But also with last mod, I think we are not doing a great job explaining when you should update that tag, because it should be something like last significant update, like when you are updating the content itself, not the some head tag um, or element like H in in the HTML. I disagree. Okay. <laughs> I I know that some search engines use it, like for example, Bing. Um, I, I know that Bing is using it and Google doesn't use it because reasons. And one of the reasons is that it's highly unreliable because people want search engines to believe that their page changed so uh, it should be crawled. But in reality, the page didn't even change, for example, or it changed just a little. I think it's it's trickier in, in that regard, yeah. I mean, it's still like you can pull out the, the primary content and say like this content changed, but at the same time, you could change something in your heading or something in your footer or in the sidebar that has links to other pieces of content. And technically that's, that's a change on your page. And technically that's something that search engines could find value in. So maybe the issue is more that there's difference of opinion on what the date should be. And then at that point, it's like, well, if people mean different things with the same value, like what can search engines do with it? Oh, that's fair. Well, and you bring up a good point, like significant changes to search engines or to users, because it maybe is that different? What would be considered significant or like an interesting change, like just changing a link or, oh, we had added this reference or something. This could be a new page for a search engine to identify. Uh, but for a user, it's just like, well, that's another link. Okay. I mean, it, it could be something like adding structured data where the user doesn't see any change at all. But for the site owner, it's, it's really important because suddenly you're providing information for search engines that they could show in, in a different snippet, for example. All right. Fair point. I'll buy in. But I mean, Kind of, kind of this discussion of like, what is actually a change that should be flagged as a date? I adding, doing that in in an automated way across a larger website, I imagine that's, that's pretty tricky. Well, the change frequency or the last mod? Because the last mod seems like that could be okay. Because it's like in the past. I, I think the change frequency, like you can't really know ahead of time, but uh, last modification, date, even that feels like something where people might say, oh, well, the last time I edited this article or the last time the HTML changed. Right. I imagine that you are updating something in the in the head for the whole site, like you are injecting a verification tag, for example, and then it propagates across all your pages and you have 2 million pages and suddenly all the chain, all the last mod tags are updated to basically now. Is that useful? I doubt it. I don't know. Or you change your copyright date. Like at the end of the year, it's like copyright 2022. We've actually seen that. I remember uh, someone from the sitemap team uh, back in the days was uh, complaining. That was a real issue that when New Year's hit, the large portion of the change frequencies updated to January 1st. 
Ah, so if it was an issue, that means it was used. I can confirm or deny anything without the explicit approval of the secretary. Another thing that that kind of came out with sitemaps. So so I thought like two kind of semi-related things were pretty cool at the time. Uh, so the the standard was kind of announced, or or the the beta. I don't know how they framed it in the early days, uh, but they also created this kind of console thing where site owners could go and verify their site and add sitemap files. Webmaster tools. Webmaster tools. Yeah. The early webmaster tools. Sitemaps. Google sitemaps. Tool? Did it have the word tool or console? I think it was called Google sitemaps. And people just knew that this was like a thing that you could use. You didn't need the word tool in the name. You, you know how we are really good at picking terms that are ambiguous? Oh, yeah. OK. So Google sitemaps. Excellent. Excellent name for many things. The tool, probably also the docs and the help group. Yeah, the, the help group was the other thing that came out at the time because it was positioned kind of as a beta for site owners and they wanted to get their feedback, I guess. So they created a help group for site owners, uh, specifically around sitemaps. And I I got involved in that at the time as well, kind of helping people with their- Like pre-Google? Yeah, pre-Google, helping people to figure things out. Oh, you were a Bionic poster, right? That was, I, I think, before that. And at some point, it migrated from being a, a group about sitemaps to being the Webmaster Help Group or something like that. That, that, was, that was pretty fun. I, and I guess in the early days, like there wasn't a ton of documentation from Google's side about how to make websites. So there's lots of guessing and people trying to make tests. It was interesting. Did it just start out with how to use sitemaps and then kind of grow from there? So I, I think the the main problem there was because there was no other Google official discussion forum for, for these kind of SEO topics, everyone went to the sitemaps group and was like, why is my website not being indexed? And luckily, we solved that problem. Right, Gary? I don't want to talk about it. It's uh, still a trauma uh, for me. I still have PTSD. Um, I mean... Other parts of Google or other search engines of Google, like Google News, uh, they had similar problems. They didn't have documentation or the documentation was not great. Um, and uh, that's uh, how I got involved in new sitemaps as well. Because I don't know if you know, but uh, sitemaps can have extensions because it's an XML file and it's extensible. Oh, wait. So so new sitemap is different from a normal sitemap? I thought it was just smaller. What? No? What? I, I thought there was just a limit of like the number of pages that you could include. Wait, you know the answer to this? We've been trying to track down why there's a discrepancy. We thought maybe there's a discrepancy. There is a discrepancy or not? Uh, we don't know. Now we're trying to find out. No, I'm asking John. Yeah, John. I, 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 I was never involved with the, the new side of things. You would know more. Well, you seem to know something. Yeah. I, I just know it's like smaller file. Maybe I knew more about this in the past, and you're kind of making me worry that I'm forgetting things, but I I don't really know the details of what what otherwise is kind of special around new sitemaps. So let's go back to, to sitemap extensions, because uh, those are one of the exciting things that you can do with sitemaps. Basically, you have the, the base sitemap, and then you can extend it with a, a new namespace, like XML namespace. And then it becomes an image sitemap, or a video sitemap, or new sitemap. And I'm pretty certain that there are a bunch of more uh, different sitemaps as well that we didn't talk about. But those seem to have been very popular also in the earlier days of sitemaps. Um, I think video sitemaps, for example, came to be around like 2008, 2009, when Universal Search was launched. And then video became more prominent um, on search result pages. And then we started adding, because that was a Google thing, like it was a Google sitemap extension. We could just add text to it whenever we wanted, which I can't decide if it was a good thing or a bad thing. Definitely good. OK, it was a good thing. Uh, now it's a bad thing. Why is it a bad thing? <laughs> well, you would know um, because uh, you maintain our documentation and some of these sitemap extensions have these kilometer long, oh, I'm sorry, half mile long tables with tags and attributes. Yes, I do know about that. Um, do you think that they need to be that long? 
I'm fairly certain that they shouldn't be that long. What makes you say that? M my You just have a gut feeling. <laughs> Things should be shorter, more succinct, and if they are too long... I, th I think it would be worth uh, l looking into those tags and attributes and see if uh, they are still useful, because some of them have been replaced, or not replaced, complemented, let's say, with um, schema org, schema.org annotations, like schema, what's, what's it called? What's the name? Structured, Structured data. Structured data, markup, yeah. schema, these are all fair words to be using. So some of those things, some of those uh, tags and attributes um, have a structured data counterpart. And if they have a structured data counterpart, then maybe it's better to supply them in the structured data because then all parsing is in one place instead of two different places. Because usually when you have it, well, usually when you have it in two different places, then sometimes you might end up with conflicts. Like for example, the sitemap is generated offline, not when the page is rendered. So it might have a different value for a tag, but technically the structured data on the page should always be the up-to-date version, I guess. That makes sense. Because that happens when you actually render the page or pull the data from the from your database for the page. So maybe some of those tags could go. So maybe we should go check with the video team and see if all they need is the structured data and see if there's some like tidying that we could do in the sitemap extensions. I mean, video team, the Google Images team, and probably also the sitemaps team, because we also have to figure out how, if at all, is possible to air code deprecate these tags. I imagine like that's some somewhat of a longer process anyway. Kind of, especially if I, I imagine like it won't be that the sitemap file will stop working. It's just like we will primarily pull the data from from the markup on the page, then and then it's more like we work with, together with the team and then we work together with the ecosystem to let them know about the change early on so that they can update if they want to. Because I imagine a lot of the sitemap generators out there, they haven't been touched in many years because they just work and it's like, why would you change it if it's working? What do you think about the future of sitemaps? Should we transform them into JSON objects, for example, because everyone loves JSON? Everybody likes JSON. I don't know how JSON feels about that. Um, Not that JSON. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Wrong I, JSON. I, I don't know. I, I kind of feel, uh, on the one hand, XML is, is a really ancient format, so it's kind of weird to keep using, but it, it kind of just works for for this purpose. Uh, so especially uh, about informing search engines or anyone who's interested in a website, what, what the pages are on the website. I I don't know like what the future will be. Like there's uh, the initiative, I think, from Bing and some other search engines about index now, where you submit individual pages. Uh, there's the indexing API from our side where you also submit individual pages. Maybe at some point things will transition in that direction, but I don't know. I, I still kind of find the process of crawling websites useful to understand the websites a little bit better. So I don't want to move to a model of people don't understand what their website is actually like when it's crawled and like they just submit pages whenever they think like this page is interesting. It should still be something that is crawlable. And that kind of maps to what users see as well, because if a website is crawlable, then users can also click around and find the content. And that's ultimately kind of the important part. You guide people to part of a website and they should be able to dig deeper from there and find out more. So Gary, what do you think about the future of sitemaps? I'm very fond of sitemaps, um, but I also want to see things evolve a little, but I also don't like JSON because JSON is weird. I, I think there, there are like two possible directions that could happen. On the one hand, you could just submit a, a text file of all of the URLs from your site, where basically we say, well, all of these attributes haven't been that super useful. Like you should just give us a list of the URLs. And that might be one approach. Uh, the other approach that I, I don't know if Index Now uses this or indexing API could be where you actually submit the pages themselves uh, ki kind of directly. So it's not that search engines would have to crawl your web page to find the information there, uh, but rather that the information is together with the submission. And my feeling is that will be trickier because 
people, I don't know, it, it adds an extra layer of complexity and it makes it so that it's easier to get those two sides out of sync. You submit something to a search engine and you have something different on your website for accidental reasons or for spammy reasons or whatever, but kind of that disconnect feels kind of tricky. Tricky for them or tricky for search engines? I think both sides, because uh, a search engine or anyone who's kind of consuming this still has to look at the pages to confirm that actually this is reasonable. And at that point, you're crawling the page. So it's what it, what is the difference? We do get a lot of people writing in that seems to think that this is like how it should work, that they should just be able to send us this URL that we haven't indexed. And like, there should just be like a box for them to be like, upload, here's this URL, Google, please know about it. But it seems like it's more complex than that, that they might not know that all these other things that they should be thinking about. I mean, that, that could be a good topic for a future episode where we talk about what gets into our crawl queues and what does not, because it is way more complicated than just submitting a sitemap. Basically with a sitemap, you are just telling search engines, any search engine that your URLs are here, you do whatever you want with them. You're not instructing that you want these crawled. Or not crawled. Well, you're with sitemaps, you cannot say not crawled. You use robots.txt for that, right? Oh, look, we made a complete loop. Full circle. And that's it for this episode. Thanks for joining us here, folks. Next time on Search Off the Record, we'll be talking about the future of the web with Alan Kent. We've been having fun with these episodes, and I hope you, the listener, have found them both entertaining and insightful as well. Feel free to drop me a note on Twitter or chat with us at one of the next virtual or in-person events that we go to if you have any thoughts. And of course, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you, and goodbye. Bye now. Goodbye. Goodbye.